feel that in different ways. Great to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Prime Minister, thank you very much for, for coming today. We have in the room 500 unionized construction leaders from across the country, coast to coast. Every province is represented. And you first came to this conference approximately 10 years ago. And I was in the audience at the time, and it was before you were Prime Minister. And you committed to this room that you would come back every year, regardless of your political fortune. And here you are. You have come back every year. Thank you very much for that. You know, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on in Canada. We'd be really interested to hear your perspective of all those things. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. I can speak really loud. No, no, here, let me see. There we are. There here we are. are. Now it's good. Right. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Thank you, Sean, for those, those words. Thanks for um, the reminder. I know, I was, I was trying to think. I think we might have missed the pandemic year. It was, it was virtual, but I've been back right. pretty much every, yeah. every single year uh, because, because we're trying to build a country here. And who better to build a country with than the CBTU? Um, you have always been at the heart of our plan to grow the middle class and to create a country that actually worked for all Canadians in all the right ways. And from that first day, you've been amazing, amazing partners. Uh, I want to thank Seamus uh, for giving the speech so I didn't have to, um, because I wanted to do something slightly different this year and actually have a conversation with you, Sean, right. uh, where we could talk about some of the challenges we're facing, because there's no question that from 10 years ago or even from eight years ago when I first came to speak here as Prime Minister, the world has changed in some really, really challenging ways. Um, we've had Trump and the attacks on Canadian workers in so many different sectors. We had a pandemic that massively threw us all for a, work, uh, a loop and changed so, so, so much is done. Uh, and created a level of polarization we're still trying to struggle through. We saw um, financial crisis with inflation and interest rates that's hitting people hard, disruptions in supply chains, changing of the world of work and the way we work with much more hybrid coming in, layered on to a level of impacts of climate change and extreme weather events that makes us have to build and create things differently and plan differently for future generations. And shifting geopolitics that has a rise of populism along with a decline in democratic values and principles, a strengthening of authoritarianism, shifting geopolitical poles and players in ways that are creating a whole lot of instability. And on that backdrop of massive amounts of instability, citizens are worried about putting food on the table every night for their families, about what kind of jobs are gonna be there to carry them through to retirement, and more importantly, what kind of jobs are gonna be there for their kids to get out there, work hard, earn an honest wage, support their families, and build the future. Because that's been the promise of Canada always, that the hard work of every generation would leave the next generation with more opportunities to work hard, sure, but to succeed even better than the previous generation. And right now, not just right now, it's been building up for a number of years, I think, Trump's election in 2016 was a symptom of that. Right now, that sense of the middle class being able to succeed and thrive isn't as strong as it was before. And more specifically, young people, Gen Zs just starting into the workforce, 
millennials with young families are looking at things like the housing market and saying, you know, it may have worked for my parents and my grandparents that you could work hard and buy your own home. Young people are working incredibly hard. They have side hustles. They're doing everything right. And yet, no matter how much they save up, if they even manage to save up because rents are so high, housing ownership just keeps receding faster and faster. And it's been doing that for a few years. So that has left everyone anxious, everyone worried about where the future is going. And into that, the easy answers of populism are very, very good at reflecting back that anxiety and even amplifying anger and dissatisfaction. There's a lot to be frustrated about in the world right now. But the trick that populists have successfully won on around the world is doing a very good job of pointing out all the things that are needing improvement, but doing no work to actually provide solutions or opportunities. No way to do the hard work of building the answers to these challenging, intractable questions that are there in every democracy around the world. And actually, we don't even have to talk about populism right, as it is right now. Going back to 2015, what we got elected on, what we asked for your help on in the run-up to 2015 and then to get to work on after we formed government was about how to actually rebuild the strength of that middle class. And that's where partnership with labor has been core to everything this government has done. Yes, we started with repealing uh, uh, 377 and 525. But more than that, and I'm not diminishing that, you know how important that was and how much the Conservative Party after that election vowed to prevent us from doing it, even bringing it to the Senate, to try, using the Senate to try and stop it, because they were so, so much a believer in that ideologically. But more than that, you were partners in building the projects that were going to build this country, getting back into the business of transit and infrastructure, getting back in the business of building housing as a federal government building pipelines, moving forward on the big projects that were going to prepare us for the future. And that's the work that is more important now. Basically, the argument by the conservatives out there is that everything we've done, whether it's fighting climate change, investing in a net zero economy, investing in the kinds of jobs through the bringing in big global investors and increasing foreign direct investment, putting money in people's pockets with the Canada Child Benefit, or building child care, moving forward on pharmacare and dental care, all those things were wrong. Because that's what they voted against every single time in the House of Commons. That all those things we did were not just wrong for the country, they led to the challenge we're in right now. And that's where facts are so important on a fundamental level. And I promise we'll get to questions. I'm just on a <laughs> rant here. That's where facts are so important in a fundamental way. Huh. Canada has the best fiscal position of any of the large industrial country, industrialized countries in the world. We have the best fiscal position in the G7. The lowest deficit. The lowest deficit, the lowest debt as a size of our GDP. We're the third largest economy in the world with a triple A credit rating from the international bond rating agencies whose job is to look at the sustainability of a country's finances after the US and Germany. We have a strong fiscal position. The question is, what do we then do with it? Now, I fundamentally believe confident countries Invest in themselves, invest in their people, invest in communities, invest in the future. And the contrast right now is with the Conservative Party that doesn't believe in that. That has stood against all the major investments we've made recently, either in a social safety net to strengthen communities and workers, or to support unions with 
uh, the, the UTIP program and apprenticeships and, and uh, elimination of, of student, uh, student interest fees, but also stands against uh, all the investments in significant uh, global projects starting here in Canada. From Volkswagen to Stellantis to E1 Moly to Dow to Rio Tinto to Northvolt to all the big things to, to uh, uh, Michelin and Bridgewater to many, many more. And so the challenge I have for all of you, because you've all, many of you, been here in these rooms hearing and being part of building this, is not actually for all of you. Because I know you as elected leaders understand your responsibilities. One of the challenges we have is the level of misinformation, disinformation, uh, nonsense out there on social media means that your members are being convinced not to vote in their own interest, but to lash out in anger. And I will continue to try and have reasonable conversations and not fall into the misinformation, disinformation game. I'm not going to try and fit the solution to all our problems on a bumper sticker or in a seven-second uh, seven TikTok video. I'm going to continue to have real conversations with people. But you all need to be part of those conversations because your members trust you more than they trust any given politician. And your role in making sure Canadians are thoughtful about the kind of future we're building, the kind of country we're building, is more important than it ever has been. And that's why I'm so glad to be here today. Anyway, that's enough of that. Great, Turn to thank you, Sean. you. Thank you, Prime Minister, thank you. So, you know, you're, you know as you've said, and as Minister O'Regan said uh, in his introduction, the, the amount of achievements that your government has delivered for workers in Canada is quite extraordinary. Uh, when you look at the, the physical reality, the infrastructure investments that you've made, the TMX uh, pipeline, uh, the investment tax credits uh, that are coming forward, that this is like the strongest definition of prevailing wage UK in history. Uh, this is really going to lift workers right across this country up, create those good paying middle class, mostly union jobs. And, and that's fantastic, the UTIP funding and everything that you've talked about. But there are some bumps along the way. And we are very supportive of the investments in EV battery production. And what many folks don't realize about our industry and the unionized construction industry and our contractors is that we build the building, then we also install the process equipment, and then we provide the maintenance for that work on an ongoing basis. And so we have grave concerns when there are projects, particularly one in Windsor, where international workers are going to work when Canadians who have the skills and the training, it's not about knowledge transfer in this case, they have the skills and the training are available to go to work. So will you commit to us that for this project and future projects, you will do everything that your government can do to make sure most of these jobs go to Canadian workers. Yes, absolutely yes. And let me, let me again take a little bit of a step back. These jobs, this decision we made as a government, and it was a choice we made by this government, to build an EV supply chain, to build an EV ecosystem in Canada, was a deliberate choice we made. First of all, we saw the way the world is going, we see where the auto sector is, we see the, the desire, the importance for electric vehicles. We also see Canada with a 80% plus clean energy grid is a great place to have and to take advantage of EV charging with clean energy. So we knew we needed to be part of it. And over the years, we made deliberate, specific choices to do that. We went from I don't even know what rank, till last year we were ranked second in the world after only China in terms of EV supply, battery supply chains in the world by Bloomberg. And then this year we passed China. We are now the number one uh, country in the world for a battery supply chain. Yeah. But we didn't do it because the government said, okay, let's build electric cars or let's sell electric cars to the world or to Canadians. We did it because we said, 
This is where the jobs are going to be in the future. When we look at making investments, at drawing in a Volkswagen or a Stellantis or a Honda, it's not about, well, partially it's okay, yes, we're going to create products here in Canada that we can sell to the world and, and grow the economy. But mostly it's the create part, it's the build part. It's the, these are good jobs in an industry that is changing so that we know there are going to be decades more good jobs in those communities. It's about the jobs. It's about the stability and the work that we're drawing in these investments. That's why we're choosing things that are going to go long term. Uh, in Hamilton, when I uh, walked around one of the steel making plants and talked to people who were third generation, or just in Honda, at Honda last week, talking about the, uh, the folks who've worked there for 50 years, or for 30 years, they were second and third generation Canadians working in those, sorry, second or third generation workers at that particular plant for that industry, we're now guaranteeing there will be fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth generations of workers in these investments because we're doing that. So at the center of our desire to draw in these investments and partnership is to make sure there are good, well-paying jobs for Canadians in a world where Jobs and careers are shifting so rapidly, we needed to lock those in. So yes, it's part and parcel of it that we expect that the construction, the installation, the maintenance be done by Canadians as much as is humanly possible. We've been pushing on the plants to make sure that. I know your conversations are going very well with that. And one of the examples is that when we made that announcement with Honda last week, I was told up front, oh, Honda's already working with CBTU to make sure uh, that the installation, the workers, that the build happens by, uh, by Canadian uh, unionized workers. So right. that message is through, but we're going to continue to be there right. to push it. Okay, thank you. That, that is true with respect to Honda. We've had preliminary conversations, and we're looking forward to signing an MOU, and that's very encouraging. We still have issues with LG, Stellantis, and Nexstar. And we're waiting on formal conversations with Volkswagen. And, and so we're encouraged by the fact that we're having these conversations with Honda up front before the construction actually starts. And so, you know, we need your government support and leverage with these foreign direct investments to make sure they make good on their promise to Canada. And not just for production, but to make sure they make good on their promise to Canada to construction workers the brothers and sisters in this room and there's nothing that I would say disturbs a construction worker more and it's not about uh, a, a kind of animosity towards a foreign worker we work along foreign workers all the time in the oil science building the plants and our in our automotive plants when when they come in to commission the projects and to supervise the projects but when you have a Canadian worker sitting at home collecting employment insurance in their home community, and there are foreign workers doing his or her work in a plant that is just completely inexplicable to that Canadian worker. We can't have that happen, Prime I, Minister. I agree entirely, and we will be there to support you every step of the way. We will be there to lean in to make sure uh, that the intent and the support of the contracts is there. I also want to highlight that this is becoming a larger issue, and it's being amplified by the opposition parties, which is, which is fair game, and we're certainly going to uh, continue to respond and make sure that we all agree uh, that we need to make sure there are as many Canadian workers as possible, if not uh, almost all Canadian workers doing the construction and maintenance and, and installation. I will highlight, though, that it is something that the Conservatives seem to have latched onto to try and distract from the fact that they actually don't support the Stellantis investment or the Volkswagen investment or the Honda investment. Pierre Pauly has been very, very cautious about just talking about corporate welfare and not making these investments. So, you know, even as they're supposedly there to worry about workers, they're actually, if they had their way, and certainly if they had been in government and not made the decision to draw in global investment in the EV sector, there would be no jobs neither installation and construction jobs or production jobs. We had to fight really, really hard 
to get those investments to create those, those jobs and those, the, those communities to bounce back. And the Conservatives just shrugged, said corporate welfare. So if you get the chance tomorrow when he's here, um, ask Pierre Polyev uh, about you know, actually pronouncing on whether or not he's supportive of uh, those investments, whether or not he regrets the fact that he fought so hard for 525 and 377. Ask him about whether he's actually going to stand with workers, even though for 20 years of his career in Parliament, he has ideologically stood against workers every single step of the way until, oh, suddenly he needs votes in order to get elected and he's turning it around. Because, you know, look for actions, not just for what people say, and I am proud to stand by the actions of what we have built together. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and we, we have said publicly, and everyone in this room is very much supportive of these in investments in EV supply chain, electric vehicles, and batteries, and Dow chemicals, and small modular reactors, and hydrogen projects coast to coast. In my, in my uh, presentation later today, we're going to talk about all of that. So we're very supportive of that. We recognize the job creation that it is going to generate for our workers, and in fairness, and I don't want to, you know, unnecessarily pick on one project, but in fairness, in Windsor right now, we do have over a thousand unionized construction workers building the base building. Uh, so we can't lose sight of that, and, and, and we are thankful and grateful that we are doing that work. The, it becomes a little bit more nuanced when it comes to that process equipment and install. And so I appreciate your pledge to help us fix that. On a related issue is something that we've been struggling with in this industry for a long time, and that is the, uh, we would say, the, the, the use of the temporary foreign worker program. And there's recent changes made by Minister Bossano uh, that would kind of, I would say, I would describe it as strengthening the temporary foreign worker program, putting some limits on the number of temporary foreign worker applications for certain industries. But construction was excluded. And, and we have issues in lower mainland, lower mainland BC. Uh, we have issues in Ontario. We have issues in many of our provinces, in many of our communities. Uh, in addition to undocumented workers, which is another kind of subject. But on the temporary foreign worker file, years ago, I remember when I was Water to Wellington businessman, Water to Wellington Dufferin Gray Building Trades business manager, the ESDC, I can't remember what it was called back in those days, but they would phone and say, we have a temporary foreign worker application here. How are your union halls? Do you have members available to go to work? And we would give them an answer, and we'd be able to turn them around and use Canadian workers instead of temporary foreign workers. That has stopped now. Our union halls do not get consulted about availability of labor when temporary foreign worker applications are being submitted. Will your government pledge to return to that process where our union halls are consulted about labor availability before a TFW application is granted in construction? No. Uh, the temporary foreign worker program has expanded far too much, particularly over the past few years post-pandemic. Post I know Minister Boissonneau is going to be here to engage with that more directly, but the, the fundamental principle is jobs should go to Canadians first, period. It's that simple. Yeah. And Unions are the easiest and the best way of making sure, not just that Canadians can get those jobs, but that when they get their jobs, they'll be well paid. Unfortunately, we are seeing the use of TFWs as a way of keeping wages low or even driving wages lower. At a time of rising costs, you can understand that that is uh, a pressure that employers are feeling, and that's part of why we've seen a huge spike in the numbers of temporary foreign workers over the past few years. Uh, yes, there's a beginning to be a labor shortage in Canada in many different sectors, uh, similar to other advanced democracies around the world. Uh, we need to make sure we're responding to that. There will be areas in which we're always going to need temporary foreign workers. I uh, think of certain agricultural industries and things like that. But in places where there are so many young Canadians stepping up to be part of the trades. Uh, there are so many people ready to st help build the future of this country concretely uh, for years to come. 
We need to make sure that that program is well calibrated, uh, and that's one of the tasks we've given to Minister Boissonneau, and working with unions will be part and parcel of how we make sure we get that program right for Canada, so Canada can grow uh, with all the workers it's needed, but that those workers be Canadians first, always. Yes, thank you. And, you know, and as I said previously, this is about making the temporary foreign worker program work for us and work for our industry. It's not anti-foreign worker. It's about making it work for our industry. And as I've said, in many cases, we work alongside, and it's not unusual when there's labor shortages to bring temporary foreign workers in. We understand that. And so we just want to make sure it works for us and works for Canadians much more better than it does right now in the construction industry. So that return to conversation with our unions around labor market impact assessments before being granted is critical. So, so we really do appreciate that. The other thing I wanted to ask you about is through your recent budget, you have made a lot of announcements in leading up to the budget around housing and, and other investments, uh, EV supply chain, which we talked about previously. What we really like about the investment tax credits is that something it's, it's really game breaking in terms of attaching labor conditionality on public sector investment. And so, you know, we've always been of the belief that the government is going to put billions of dollars into private sector owners who are well capitalized, have strong balance sheets, usually make money. If we're going to use taxpayers' money to support the private sector, we damn well better make sure it's tied to good paying union jobs. And, and so when you look at these investments in housing and these other investments, will your government consider expanding and entrenching labor conditionality and attach it to government's investment with private sector entities? Uh, yes. Um, it's a change we made with the ITCs where we started with uh, because it, it wasn't something, surprisingly, that had been done in Canada in the past. So we started with those big projects. If you're building, if we're you know, investing to build a, a new nuclear power plant or a new uh, small modular reactor or a, or a new uh, you know, wind, wind power farm or, or solar, like whatever investments or even in uh, clean energy or hydrogen or what have you, those are big, big projects where it's easy to check on utilization of union, uh, union members or equivalent uh, to union paid jobs uh, to make sure that this public money is going towards creating the good jobs that are going to be enough to sustain families, to sustain communities. We are very much looking at how we expand that, uh, how we make sure that that principle of government ensuring that people get paid good wages, that the fruits of the growth of the economy and the opportunities Canada has be more evenly shared by those who are rolling up their sleeves and doing the work to build that economy and build that future. And that applies to, yes, uh, putting in uh, labor standards and requirements around uh, big government investments for the ITCs, but it also is the principle that links to um, our replacement worker legislation, uh, which is about making sure that there is strength at the bargaining table to ensure that workers get paid properly and fairly and that, that the, the kinds of negotiations don't get shortcut with uh, heavy hands of advantages for, uh, for employers. Because ultimately, an employer that is not sustaining the community in which they are anchored are not going to do well for the long term. In the community uh, struggles, eventually the employer will struggle as well. Sometimes the short-term thinking means people are willing to make that bet, but we're not as a government. And that's why we're looking always at the long term, because one of the things, and I talked about it earlier, that principle of fairness. The economy doesn't seem fair for far too many people. It doesn't work the way it used to. And that's, this is a phenomenon happening around the world. And that's where if the system is advantaging you know, certain groups or certain types of people who are succeeding you know, inordinately and everyone else is struggling to get by, the system needs to change. And that's where government has a direct role to play, to make sure that the system is fairer, especially if it's not particularly for young people right now. 
And that's the choice we're making. And again, there's a contrast related to the choice Canadians are going to make next year, where you hear Conservatives constantly saying, government should step back, get out of the way, allow the free market to settle things out. That's a belief in a kind of trickle-down that has never worked to support workers in their communities, has never built a strong economy for this country. And particularly now, where you have the concentration of capital and wealth in smaller and smaller numbers of, of uh, Canadians' hands, um, making sure that the benefits of growth actually accrue to entire communities and to all Canadians and all generations, that does require a government to step up. Step up on things like dental care, step up on things like pharmacare, step up on things like child care, step up on uh, investments to build affordable housing. Pierre Polyev was the affordable housing minister in the last government. He built 16 units of affordable housing in the entire time he was minister. That federal government chose to get out of the business of investing in housing, and that's part of why, and I'm always loath to do this, but you guys understand construction takes a while, and if you remove the federal government for 10 years under Stephen Harper from construction of affordable housing, no wonders over the following 10 years there have been challenges around getting affordable housing for Canadians. And that's why we're having to turn around with such a big ambitious plan right now to make sure that you know, electricians and carpenters and, and, uh, uh, and teachers and nurses can actually live in the cities where they're building homes and apartment mm. buildings and units. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, you that is a huge issue for Canadians, obviously, housing and affordability, and, and as you said earlier, uh, given rise to a general angst in society and the prospects of the middle class, which in turn has converted itself into populism, which is, creates challenges for, for all elected officials. And, and you, you've been prime minister for nine years now, and, and it's not an easy job. I would say it's probably the toughest job in the country next to maybe a business manager of a local union. <laughs> but, but it is, in all seriousness, it is a, a really tough job. And uh, professionally and personally, uh, you have to take this responsibility on on behalf of all Canadians and deal with a lot of things on a daily basis that most average Canadians will look at on the news and say, oh my goodness, like, why do you do this? Why, what drives you, Prime Minister, to continue to do this and get up each and every day and, and face the day and the day's challenges, which are much different than they were in 2015. I remember you were famously saying about sunny ways and, and you know, it's hard to maintain that kind of positivity dealing with everything that you do. So how do you do that? What drives you? Well, first of all, the idea that there are any easy jobs right now in Canada, um, they're all hard. Everyone yeah. is juggling forces and pressures that seem far worse than Fair they enough. were 10 years Absolutely. ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things that we're all, we're all faced with. But that makes both the work more important and the attitude you go into it with more important. I mean, I do have a big advantage in my life in that I watched my dad be Prime Minister, and I didn't know what he was doing day to day. I saw how hard he worked as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old kid can. But as I learned later in life about the things that he did, nobody talks about how hard the budget was in 1976, or you know, the minister that said a silly thing in 1981 uh, that then you know, dominated the news cycle for a week. People talk about the big things. The big things like multiculturalism, the Official Languages Act, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. These are the things that actually shape the country for the long term. And the thing that drives me is this idea that we are in a moment right now, and everyone feels it, where the world is changing faster and more radically than it ever has before, perhaps uh, other than the, the years following World War II when there were deep, deep shifts in the way our societies worked and how the world organized itself. And there is certainly less intentionality than the construction of you know, global institutions 
that followed World War II. Right now, everything's coming at us from climate change to AI, uh, to populism, to uh, a rebalanced global order, to authoritarianism, to weaponization of trade, to changing you know, nature of the energy mix, to the changing nature of work. Everything is changing. And what we decide as a country matters deeply and will matter. What we decide now will shape the next 10 years, the next 50 years. And not just of Canada, but of the world. Right now, there are choices being made by citizens around the world to go in different directions, to address and solve the challenges or to push them off for a few more generations when you think of climate change, when you think of investments in education and childcare. And this moment right now is one that I am inspired by every time I speak with Canadians and have a real conversation. Every time you have a chance to actually talk with someone about their worries and their hopes for the future, and their anxiety, yes, but also their ambition for what they want to try and do and build and create, what they want to give to their kids, and the anxiety about whether they're going to be able to do it, but still, that optimism that underlies it, that inspires me. It inspires me how Canadians remain thoughtful and positive, even when we're busy recognizing how challenging it is right now. And as I travel around the world and talk to other foreign leaders, we talk about, you know, Canada has the critical minerals, Canada has the trade deals with the world, Canada has access to the largest market in the world immediately to our south. We have world-class research institutions and universities. We have super innovative, you know, scientists looking at all the next wave of whether it's robotics or AI and how that's going to improve the lives of workers and not replace workers. Uh, we look at quantum uh, computing and how that's the next level on everything as we have, you know, look at our social safety net. But fundamentally, as we look at Canadians themselves, best educated in the OECD, a reliable workforce that shows up to build stronger communities, look out for our neighbors. Fundamentally, in this time of, of pressures, of pivot, if Canada can't figure out, with all our advantages, all our resources, all our space, all our you know, positive welcoming of people around the world because of our openness, but all of our rigor in being there for each other and working hard and creating a stronger economy every day, if we can't figure out how to navigate through the second quarter of the 21st century as a free, open democracy with strong institutions and uh, resilient communities, then which country will? That's the moment we're in right now. And quite frankly, over the next year and a half, Canadians are going to be faced with a very simple choice. Do we continue to invest in our communities, to invest in our future? Do we continue to fight climate change? Do we continue to make sure that the most vulnerable around us get the supports they need to be able to achieve their potentials? Do we continue to believe that facts and evidence and open-mindedness to each other's perspectives and seeing differences as a source of strength, not as a source of weakness and polarization? Do we continue to do the work that has built Canada over generations? Or do we throw up our hands and say, I don't know, everything's broken. We just need to burn it all down or start all over. You know how hard it is to build something, how much attention it takes to every different step, how many different people have to work together with different skills to build something that works. 
And when you face challenges, you think creatively about how to solve it. You roll up your sleeves, you put in a few more hours to try and go at the problem differently. You lean on some experts. You bring in a friend from another site to say, okay, how would you solve this? You go to one of the teachers at the local school, the, the trade school, to say, okay, you know, what would you say if, if I had this challenge? You figure out how to fix it. You don't stand there screaming at it saying, I'm just walking away because it's all broken. And that choice that Canadians get to make in the coming year, which is the mirror of the kinds of choices people are making in every democracy around the world right now, is about not just who gets to form government through this challenging time, but what kind of country do we want to be? What are the values that underpin who we are? And indeed, who are we as Canadians? Who are we as a people? Are we people who roll up our sleeves and dig in and lean on each other when things get, go, things get challenging? Or do we hunker down in our own little corners, surround ourselves with people who say and think exactly like we do, and hope the storm passes if we're shaking our fist at the sky long enough? That's not what has built this country. And what motivates me every single day is the conversations I have with people who see, yes, that we're in challenging times, but understand the responsibility that comes with the opportunity of being Canadian. The opportunities we have in communities right across this country to build and create a country that is fair for every generation, that creates that, that future that we know we can have. And that's, that's what drives me forward. And quite frankly, you know, you say I've been doing this job for, for eight and a half years. This job changes every day. Uh, every year, every month, there's a new challenge, a new wrinkle. And that capacity to lean on people, Canadians, pull people together and try and solve through it is, is something that I, that I know matters and I absolutely love doing. And I will continue to do it. As, as long as I possibly uh, can continue to get the support of Canadians. Because right now, more than anything else, this time we're in matters for the kind of long-term future that our kids and grandkids are going to face over the coming generations. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for those inspiring words and your, your vision of Canada. And I can assure you that folks in this room are of the mindset of let's get her done. So on behalf of the Canadian Executive Board and our 600,000 members from coast to coast to coast, we thank you very much for your time here today. And it's been a real honour to represent our members and the folks of this room to have this conversation. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Sean. And we'll see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.